there's this emphasis on kind of artificially trying to get stu draw students into the STEM fields and generate interest with the background motivation having to do with these will be things that they will need for their jobs. I think that that can lead to um, losing the, the sense of wonder and the sense of, of awe that should be there in science investigations. And so often science might be approached in a way that's very different than something like poetry, where in poetry you're actually looking at things that you consider meaningful on their own terms. And in science you always have this background idea that, hey, you've got to know this because these are skills that are necessary now in the 21st century global economy. And that can, I think, serve to dry the subject out quite a bit. Hello, and welcome back to our online course on K-12 education. Today we have an opportunity to reflect on the study of the natural sciences. I want to spend some time in this lecture thinking about how science fits into a classical model of education. For some context on what we mean by classical education, I recommend an excellent little essay by Dr. Terence Moore, who is now the principal of the Atlanta Classical Academy. Uh, and this essay is entitled, A Classical Education for Modern Times. And incidentally, this essay can be accessed on the Charter School Initiative uh, section of the Hillsdale College website. And in this essay, Dr. Moore identifies four distinctive characteristics of classical education. And these are, first, that it values knowledge for its own sake. Second, upholds the standards of correctness, logic, beauty, weightiness, and truth intrinsic to the liberal arts. Third, demands moral virtue of its adherents. And fourth, prepares human beings to assume their places as responsible citizens in the political order. So what we're talking about here is the Hillsdale College's approach to education. Um, that is education in the traditional liberal arts, uh, but translated into, the, into a K through 12 context. Again, in the words of Dr. Moore, quote, language and literature, history and government, mathematics and the sciences, music and art, in a coherent and orderly program. And so if we take this, uh, these characteristics of classical education as our framework or our background, we can ask the question, why should we include the natural sciences? Why study science as part of a classical curriculum? And more specifically, we could first ask, can we justify teaching science in this context? And I think justifying the inclusion of science is a rather low bar, and so we could also go on to ask a second question. Can the teaching of science enrich or contribute to the goals of the classical academy? And so I want to think a little bit about the extent to which uh, science might contribute to and uh, actually enrich uh, the fulfillment of these four characteristics of classical education uh, that we've just discussed. So let's start by turning our attention to how scientific knowledge is generally viewed within our culture uh, and also within education. If we start with the culture, think about this. Is it your impression that scientific knowledge is valued by the public? Or on a more personal note, do you generally respect uh, knowledge gained by scientific investigation? A recent report by the Pew Research Center entitled Public and Scientist Views on Science and Society shows that science is generally esteemed, respected, and appreciated by the public. Although it is true that um, people often disagree with specific scientific findings. I think it still remains that science is generally appreciated by the public. And uh, so why, why would that be? Well, I think there's two main reasons uh, for this general appreciation of science by the public. The first is that scientific knowledge is associated with uh, objectivity. And so people tend to think of uh, scientific truth claims as having an objective nature, uh, whereas people may think of other um, truth claims in other areas as being um, 
more opinion-based, they often think of science as dealing in facts and objectivity. And we'll, we'll, we'll look into a little bit more about whether or not that's a, a valid distinction. But I think that's one of the reasons. And I think the other reason that people generally esteem science is there's a close association in people's mind between scientific knowledge and the development of life-improving technologies. And so the idea that science is very useful uh, to the society. So that's the um, culture. Now let's move from the public sphere in general to the more specific arena of K through 12 education. When it comes to education, do you think that scientific knowledge is valued in education? Um, I've talked with teachers uh, about this question and actually I've had actual teachers answer this question in different ways. Not, not everyone uh, thinks that science is all that valued in education. Uh, but if we take a, a kind of bird's eye view from a policy level, it seems to me that at least in principle the answer to this is a resounding yes. Uh, in most statements you'll read calling for improving K through 12 education in America. Uh, science is included as of paramount importance. There's a high value placed on scientific literacy uh, for students, more so than on cultural literacy in general. And uh, typically great emphasis is placed on the critical importance of getting the so-called STEM fields uh, right. So STEM, S-T-E-M as an acronym, standing for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Education. So we have a situation where, uh, well, some fields of study, maybe Latin, for example, or uh, more, more commonly, uh, music or art or theater. Uh, sometimes these subjects have to, f have to fight for uh, kind of respect or fight to not be completely left out of the conversation. Uh, the STEM fields don't deal with that. The STEM fields are being trumpeted as being critically important uh, in education. And so I want to spend some time thinking about why. What, what is the rationale for holding up the STEM fields as so important as part of our educational system? Um, and in short, I'm, I'm sure you can uh, guess the reason. Uh, in short, the reason is jobs. If, and if you uh, Google the, the term STEM, you can easily find many examples of this. Let me just give a couple of examples. If you look at the homepage of the STEM Education Coalition, uh, right at the homepage, it states that, quote, the central mission of the STEM Education Coalition is to inform federal and state policymakers on the critical role that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM, education plays in U.S. competitiveness and future economic prosperity, end quote. And they have a checklist on their website which reads, uh, first, STEM education must be elevated as a national priority. Uh, second, our nation's future economic prosperity is closely linked with student success in the STEM fields. And third, the U.S. must expand the capacity and diversity of the STEM workforce pipeline. And so you have an idea there that, that, that K through 12 schools are functioning as a STEM workforce pipeline. Uh, another example is if you go to uh, whitehouse.gov, you can read a report written by the uh, National Science and Technology Council Committee on STEM Education. Uh, this is a five-year strategic plan for federal STEM education. Uh, this particular plan was distributed to Congress in May of 2013. And if you look at this report, the very first reason uh, given for why it is critical to invest in STEM education is the following. Quote, the jobs of the future are STEM jobs. The demand for professionals in STEM fields is protected projected to outpace the supply of trained workers and professionals. Additionally, STEM competencies are increasingly required for workers both within and outside specific STEM occupations. So this kind of rationale for science education and, and why, why it's important to get science education right is common and it trans tends to transcend political parties. And this is not a brand new idea, so this idea that our government needs to improve a science education in America has been around for some time. And this raises the question of how effective it is for the, uh, for the government to centrally plan science education in America. Uh, also, it raises the question of whether or not the, the crisis of a shortage of workers in the STEM fields actually exists. 
Uh, one, one place I would recommend to start for, for some perspective on that is an interesting article by Robert Charette at the uh, IEEE Spectrum website. And this article is entitled, The STEM Crisis is a Myth. And if, if you Google the STEM Crisis is a Myth, um, you can uh, read his article ab about this kind of boom-bust cycle that we have in America, uh, talking about shortage of STEM workers. But for now, the main point here is to see that we have, well, the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, if, if you listen to, politicians often talk about improving science education on both sides of the political aisle. And in fact, if you uh, listen to politicians talk about this, it's actually pretty unusual to hear them talk about it and not make the explicit connection between uh, STEM education and jobs in, uh, in the, the, the global economy. And so the main idea here that's being put forth is the idea that technical knowledge holds the key to economic progress. And this is the primary reason behind the emphasis on the STEM fields. And so what we have here is a very utilitarian approach where we push these um, subjects because we think they will be useful in an economic uh, kind of a sense. And I believe that this very utilitarian approach fails our children and often leads actually to a loss of interest by students in math and science. Education is much more, much richer and deeper than just preparing students to work in the global economy. So how should we view science? And why should we study science? Why should we include it in our educational program? It seems to me that the, a central fact that we all need to deal with is the fact that science is a tremendously successful enterprise. Systematic investigation of the natural world over the past 300 years has yielded a staggering amount of understanding of the way nature works, as well as control over nature. And <clears throat> so this enterprise has been more powerful uh, and more kind of successful in terms of knowledge acquisition than uh, anyone could have predicted or imagined. So how should we respond to the acquisition of so much knowledge and so much power. Well, first I'd like to outline a couple of responses that I see within our culture that I think are uh, not the right approach before going into what I think might be the best response. The first response that you'll see to the success of science and the growth of science is a suspicion of science based on perceived conflicts with religious or political views. Um, this is a, a distrust of science based on the fear that as the sphere of scientific knowledge increases, uh, the spheres of religious or political views shrink. And so this is a view of, of science and other ways of knowing being in conflict. And often this, this is a view that uh, science is inherently antithetical to religious thought. So that's one view. And then on the other side, at, at kind, of, kind of a polar opposite response, <clears throat> which in, in some ways seems to validate this first view, is our second response. And we could classify the second response as uh, material reductionism or scientism. And let me define scientism uh, according to the new Fontana Dictionary of Modern Thought. Scientism is, quote, the view that the characteristic inductive methods of the natural sciences are the only source of genuine factual knowledge and in particular that, that they alone can yield true knowledge about man and society. And so this is this idea that uh, people are so overwhelmed by the success of science that they go on to um, d declare that science is the only valid way of knowing. So in my view, neither of these responses to science or approaches to science are appropriate. Uh, and so what, what I would suggest is that our, our, our response to science should be the following. First, we should have respect and a sense of awe at the knowledge that has been gained. We are right to be impressed uh, and even overwhelmed by how well we have come to know our universe. In this ongoing, now it's not a complete understanding, but in this ongoing project, a lot of progress has been made. Um, but that should be <clears throat> tempered with 
an understanding of the limits of science. It's a mistake to be so impressed by science to declare that it's the only valid way of knowing. In the book, The Faith of Scientists in Their Own Words, which is edited by Nancy Frankenberry, there's a quote by John Polkinghorne that says, quote, although we are rightly impressed by the many things that science can account for satisfactorily, we should also recognize that this great success has been purchased by a degree of modesty of ambition. Science limits itself to considering only certain kinds of experience, end quote. And so this is the idea that's, that we understand that science is a self-limiting enter enterprise, does not seek to answer all questions, and is limited to uh, the study of physical phenomena. And so what I would like to s argue then is that science is an important part of the human account of reality. Before we get into these points here, the main idea, it's an important part of the human account of reality. And so science is, an import is important and should be included <coughs> in our study of what is real and what is true, uh, but it's only part, and so we shouldn't elevate it so high as to push away uh, the other ways of knowing. In education, we should be pointing children towards what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. And I think that understanding the natural world plays an important but not exhaustive part in that. And so we study science because it contributes to understanding ourselves and understanding our surroundings. Science addresses deep questions uh, asked by humans, many of which were first asked in antiquity, as we seek to uh, tighten our grip on reality. A ex couple of examples of these types of questions are, what is the nature of light? What is the nature of magnetism? What is the nature of the heavenly bodies? Or what is the nature of disease? Things that people have, when you start looking at the big scientific questions, you see that these are things people have been wondering about for a long, long time, and oftentimes uh, they're, they're difficult questions to solve, and there's interesting stories be behind investigating these questions. The reading assignment for this lecture is a chapter from a book called The Polkinghorn Reader, which I have here, uh, which is a selection of writings from the physicist and Anglican priest John Polkinghorne. And the particular chapter that, uh, that I've posted is entitled The Nature of Science. And in this chapter, uh, Polkinghorne argues that the actual practice of science is more subtle and more complex and more interesting than the simplified account of the scientific method that's typically presented. Uh, one thing he discusses is the critical role of personal judgment in the actual practice of science. Uh, here he's drawing on the thought of Michael Polanyi, and he, he's talking about, for, he, he, he talks about the criteria that we use to judge between competing theories uh, involving the role of, of making personal judgments. Personal judgments uh, by experts exercised with, with caution and submitted to the, uh, to the community. But he, he um, emphasizes this aspect of science as being a personal endeavor by humans. Uh, he also talks about the intense desire on the part of scientists to actually understand the way that the world is. He um, criticizes the views of positivism and um, idealism in outlining his view of science, which he argues aligns well with the actual way science is practiced. Um, and he, he calls his view critical realism. And so a after looking at uh, the way, si what, what science is and the way science actually uh, works, Polkinghorne writes, quote, science is not different in kind from other kinds of human understanding involving evaluation by the knower, but only different in degree, end quote. And elsewhere in this book, Polkinghorne argues that science is an intellectual cousin of religion. Uh, he, wrote, he writes, quote, science and theology are both concerned with the search for truth. In consequence, they complement each other rather than contrast one another. Of course, the two disciplines focus on different dimensions of truth, but they share a common conviction that there is truth to be sought, end quote. And he's, he's speaking here of science and religion, but I think the same thing could be said about uh, science and the humanities, where we have different important approaches to seeking what is true 
uh, but seeking it from different angles or looking at, like, like in that quote, uh, different dimensions of truth. Um, adding, put, put together, giving then a fuller, fuller picture. And so um, these different ways of knowing then demanding respect. And so I think we can argue then that science should be included in a classical um, curriculum because it seeks what is true about the world and it leads to understanding the world. And in fact, thinking, learning about science will be part of what elevates the students' minds towards self-government and the ability to participate in democracy. And learning the, the fundamental ideas of science and looking at the historical development of science also will put students in a position where they can thoughtfully consider some scientific issues that the public tends to not do very well with. Uh, for example, uh, evolution or global climate change or the safety of vaccines or uh, the safety of genetically modified foods, things like that. Um, having students that will be in a position to thoughtfully and carefully consider these kinds of issues that face our society. And not only that, these students who have, w when students study science kind of for its own sake and on its own terms, they will be well equipped for a jobs in STEM fields. And so to be clear, we're, we're not arguing here that jobs are not important. Jobs are important. And we want to have students graduate who have a solid grounding in science th that are going to be well equipped to major in science if they so choose uh, and will be well equipped to go on and learn the kind of uh, technical knowledge necessary for jobs in STEM fields. So if science should be included, let's think a little bit about what, what it should look like. What should the science program look like in the context that we've been discussing? And what are the hallmarks of science in classical education? Well, I think we can start by making some analogies to the list from Dr. Moore that I read uh, at the beginning. Remember, the, f the first characteristic of classical education was knowledge for its own sake. And so I think the first characteristic of science education in this kind of context is scientific knowledge for its own sake. We study science because it answers questions that we're curious about and it, it seeks what is true. Um, I think the second thing also is analogous to the second point having to do with high standards and that is a, an approach of excellence and rigor within the uh, science education, within all, all of the areas. Um, so we have the idea here is high standards. Things like attention to detail, careful work, careful observations and also the goal that each and every student will grow in their understanding of of the natural world and will uh, continue to work hard and improve. This is not the idea where <clears throat> science is taught to students that self-identify as being interested in science or wanting to go into STEM fields or something like that, but each and every student. Th th these are important ideas for each and every student to learn. The third thing is historical context. The study of science should be steeped in historical context. Um, Showing, and, and this is because, like we've said, science is a human endeavor. It is, it is uh, something taken on by, by hum curious humans, and, um, and I think we want to show the humanity of it. Also, there's a narrative, students, everybody is interested in story, and there's a narrative aspect of science that can be tapped into. Um, looking at personalities of uh, scientists, their circumstances, both personal and political circumstances, friendships that they had, rivalries that they had that influenced the uh, discoveries that they make, as well as the role that lucky accidents play in important discoveries. I think that providing uh, context can humanize science as well as make the study of science um, it more interesting and give, give students a realistic view on the way that science actually happens by studying the way that it has happened uh, in the past. The fourth uh, characteristic of, of science education in this classical context is philosophy of science. What I have in mind here is not, not so much explicitly studying the philosophy of science, but students 
getting an impression about the way science fits in to the, ov to, to the overall project of, of taking lots of different courses. And the number one thing, as we've already talked a little bit about, is students, through their study of science, students should understand, start, begin to understand the self-imposed limitations of science. They should get the impression that science is not well equipped to answer any or every important question that can, that can be asked. So science is not best suited to answer questions about beauty or meaning, for example. And, um, when a student graduates from high school, they should be able to respond thoughtfully to the claim, for example, that science has rendered all religious belief obsolete. Uh, they, sh they should be able to talk about that uh, um, in part from their, their study of science and what it is. Uh, the other piece, maybe slightly related to this, is I think uh, we want to develop within students what, what I call a healthy skepticism. So the idea here is not to, uh, not to create cynical skeptics, but to create students who have practiced weighing claims based on evidence, and so have a healthy skepticism where they ask the question, what is the evidence for thinking that a certain claim might be true? Uh, and not just take it, there, there's a lots of claims coming at us about the way, the way things are, and um, not just taking those, those in and accepting them, but asking questions about why might we believe that this is true. Um, and then the, the final uh, point is reading and writing. That is an emphasis on reading and writing in the context of science education. Reading and writing, of course, are, the, the, are, are very primary tools of learning and communicating. And uh, I think it's important to emphasize these uh, it within a, a science class. Sometimes students get the impression that writing well is important in an English class, but it's not important when you go to other types of classes. But clear, uh, clear communication through writing and explaining things in a clear and concise way is very important in science and is something that should be practiced within uh, science courses. And science provides an excellent context for uh, challenging readings as well for students to develop uh, skills in reading. And so I think these are some hallmarks or characteristics of what science might look like in uh, uh, the context of classical education. And I think when, st when students study science in this way, there's a couple of, of, of deep and important things that they will begin to learn about uh, or related to science. The first is students will begin to see that we live in an orderly, complicated, surprising, but orderly and intelligible universe that can be understood through careful, systematic investigation. And so to me, this is a, a a kind of amazing and e exciting idea, and, uh, and st students will start to see this. The second thing is that science is a part of the innate human desire to know and understand. And so I think of science as closely related to addressing what we might call the big questions. So oftentimes, I, th I, I worry that people think of over here we have uh, the humanities, we have literature, and we have philosophy, and we have theology, and they are addressing deep, interesting questions that, uh, that appeal naturally to human curiosity. And then way over here, we have uh, science and mathematics that are dealing in a kind of sterile way with, with uh, abstract facts and with um, numbers and quantifying things. Uh, but it's not very related to big ideas that people find interesting. And I like to think of them as much closer together. Science is addressing big questions that appeal to innate human curiosity in a similar way to, uh, to the, not, not the exact same questions, of course, but in a similar way to what goes on in the, hum in the humanities. And you see this in studying historical examples. So when you look at scientists of the past, you see passion coming out very clearly in many cases. You see perseverance. Uh, coming out very clearly of people not looking to invent a new technology, but looking to understand the natural world. 
and understand the way that it works. So you see this in historical examples, but you also see this in the enthusiasm of the teacher. I think that the enthusiasm of the teacher, the importance of the enthusiasm of the teacher can hardly be overstated. And I have in mind here what I think of as a kind of deep enthusiasm. So some, some teachers are kind of rah-rah type teachers and some teachers are more reserved. And that's not, that doesn't have to do with the enthusiasm that I have in mind. But I do have in mind teachers that are actually impressed and interested in uh, the ideas that they are discussing with their students. And so if science is, is looked at in this way, then um, let's, think, let's, let's finish up by thinking about what are, what are some of the goals uh, that we have for students over 12 years of studying science. What are some goals uh, that we have for students? And these are something that we build towards uh, the kind of, not end product, but the, 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 the final goal when students walk out of their K through 12 education, what are some of the things that they should have? I think that the first thing is, has to do with the content of science. Students should have an accurate understanding of the primary models and theories and laws of physical science. So they should understand, not, not comprehensively, but they should understand some of the important fundamental ideas from biology, from chemistry, from physics, and from earth science and astronomy. So that's content. Also, students should come to an accurate understanding of the process of science. And they will get this both through their own experience, hands-on investigation, uh, doing labs and activities in their classes, and having experience with actual scientific investigation. They will also get this from looking at historical examples of the process of science. The third thing is, we have, it should be a goal to develop in each and every student a deep appreciation for science. F through the study of science, students should be impressed and even moved by what they've learned about the way the natural wor world works. Now, this does not have to do with recruiting future science majors in college. Actually, at Hillsdale College, when I advise uh, freshmen, coming into college. My favorite kinds of students are the ones that say, I'm taking a chemistry course, I'm taking a calculus course, I'm taking an English course, and I'm taking a philosophy course, and I'm learning a lot in all of these courses, and I'm having a hard time deciding what to major in. And I tell them that that's right where you should be. Um, of course, you'll have to choose a major, but someone who's actually interested in learning in many different ways. And so, uh, all of the students should, should be impressed by science, even if they choose not to go on and, and continue their study of science. Um, the, the next thing is um, the ability to uh, write clearly and concisely. Um, this is a project that starts in the elementary years and goes all the way through and continues into college. Writing well is a hard thing to do and it's a, a, a difficult project to teach students how to write well. Um, but this is, this is one of our goals. And uh, along with that, also speaking, being able to communicate via speaking. And I think science provides an excellent context for that, for students to present on uh, things that they've learned, s small research project or, or actually uh, projects that they've done in the lab. Um, the, the next goal of science education is students who can do careful experiments and careful observations, students who have been taught uh, proper lab techniques, uh, as well as have been taught good habits in, their, uh, in, in the experimental side of scientific investigation. And then the final goal is students who have problem-solving skills. Um, there's a close association between mathematics and science. Mathematics is one of the important languages of science, and so we want to develop in, the, in students the ability to apply the mathematical tools that they, that they learn to problems in science. And not just from a kind of technical perspective where they, where they develop technical proficiency, but also the ability to think about what it means, uh, what, what the mathematical uh, application means, what equations actually mean physically. And two things that I really stress a lot in my classes that, 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 are, that need to be started 
all the way down in, in kindergarten are uh, reasonable answers and correct units. Oftentimes, students will solve an equation and give an answer that just a moment's reflection will show that that answer, the numerical value of the answer is not reasonable uh, given the context of the problem. And uh, also the idea of attaching the proper units to numbers. Um, it, the unit being just as important as the numerical value of the number. And this is something that students tend to forget, and so it has to be stressed over and over again as they, as they go up through um, starting basically in elementary school. And speaking of elementary school, I want to just mention, I, I think it's very important that, that these goals, well, these goals will culminate in uh, high school, they are the foundation for these goals is laid in the elementary years. Uh, I've, I've talked to several teachers, uh, elementary teachers about this, and somewhat paradoxically, given the emphasis that we have in our country on the STEM fields, oftentimes uh, uh, the study of science is actually relegated to the back burner in the elementary years. And this just has to do with limitations on time and with intense emphasis on preparing for standardized exams in reading and in math. And um, when, when, we, when we talk to charter schools, we advise them to uh, implement a broad coverage of topics in, in science in the elementary years. Not just life science, but introducing students to important ideas in chemistry and physics and earth science as well. And so this allows for elementary students to get exposure to content areas and the process of science. It allows for elementary students to start to develop the habits of careful work and hard work uh, necessary for success in science. And it starts, and, and if we, we can start making these kinds of connections in elementary school as well. Again, tapping into the narrative quality of, of scientific development, reading biographies of important scientists and making connections to history. Also, in elementary school is where we cultivate an appreciation for nature on the part of, of, of uh, students. Students naturally appreciate nature, and they are impressed by wildlife. They're impressed by sunsets. Um, they're impressed by the moon. By studying those things and understanding them more deeply, we can deepen that appreciation. Also, we can lead students to appreciate aspects of nature that they wouldn't notice on their own. So, so everybody likes sunsets and everybody likes the moon, but not everybody naturally appreciates uh, what bacteria and viruses are, for example. Or not everybody naturally appreciates that ev all matter consists of atoms and molecules. And so that's something that has to be taught to students and pointed out, and then they come to an appreciation of those ideas. By studying nature in, in, in the elementary grade, students will start to see, actually see for themselves, the order that exists in nature by categorizing things and classifying things. They begin to see order and patterns, and that there is uh, a sense, there, there's some, some sense to the way we organize uh, scientific ideas. And so they will be less intimidated by it as, as they increase complexity later. And then finally, uh, Science is an excellent context for the development of math and reading and writing skills for uh, elementary students. And so there's no reason to, to push it to the side in favor of working on writing and working on math uh, because that can be done in the context of science. Okay, so tr I've tried to show that, uh, that science is an important part of education, uh, but only a part of education and uh, some, some ideas about what I think the overall kind of bird's eye view approach uh, to science should be within a kind of classical model of education. So thank you for participating in this online course. Let me leave you with a word of exhortation. Uh, K through 12 education is saturated with emphasis on standards, benchmarks, assessments, and career readiness. Whether you're a parent or a grandparent of students, a teacher of students, or a student yourself, keep these central ideas about science education that we've been discussing in mind. And remember, we're fostering curiosity and wonder, encouraging hard and careful work, and molding deep thinkers, even intellectuals. Now, the first goal here is not technical experts who can help with global economic competition, but rather liberally educated citizens. Thank you.